Towards the end of August 2023, I travelled down a quiet forest road leading into the amazing village of Himup Fort. The, this village, which to a large extent has allowed the modern world to pass it by, is located on Stolze, a quiet lake in the Brandenburg region north of Berlin. The lake has an approximate length of 3.6 kilometers and a width of 1.4 kilometers. It has a surface area of 371 hectares and a maximum depth of 13 meters. This is part of the Uckermark Lakes Natural Park. Pike, carp, zander, tench and catfish can all be found in the lake. At the southern end of the lake there is a campsite which was full of motorhomes and tents. The weather was marvellous. As I explored the banks of the lake from the eastern side, from the forest, I sat down to film the lake. A lady completely naked walked into the lake in front of my camera and started swimming. That part of the B-roll I collected for this video will not be presented here. In fact, I've destroyed it. After all, I want to keep this a video that the whole family can enjoy. And what is better than a story about hidden treasure? At the end of August 2023, it may have been the beauty spot you can see in this video, but it was not always so. In April 1945, gunfire broke the silence. It ended the lives of between 20 and 30 concentration camp prisoners who had previously sunk several boxes carried to the middle of the peaceful lake in boats. Their task once completed, and once they got ashore, resulted in their deaths. They were shot so that they could not share the secret of what they had done. The contents of those boxes is alleged to be works of art as well as bars of gold and platinum melted down from the jewellery and teeth of concentration camp inmates. According to this story, these riches had been acquired by Hermann Goering, Reichsmarschall, Air Force Commander and by then second only to Adolf Hitler in the Third Reich. Goering's country estate, Karenhall, named after his first wife Karin, who had died in 1931, was only around 40 kilometers away. Was this one of the places where Goering wanted to hide his private treasures to be collected later after the war? There are those who have tried to salvage the alleged riches, so far without success. The historian Heinz Renkel failed, as did the Israeli journalist Yafros Sfore. According to reports in the British media, a group of unknown business people even wanted to search the bottom of the lake with a submarine a few years ago. All this makes a good story, but it's all talk and no action. But once upon a time, there was action, and that is the subject of this video. Eric Mielke was Minister for State Security of East Germany and as such head of the Stasi, the East German equivalent of the Gestapo. He was fascinated by the man who had founded the Gestapo, Hermann Goering. Goering later handed the organisation over to Himmler. However, Mielke identified himself more with Goering than Himmler. Aware of the story of the treasure, he had military divers searching the lake for months, but he failed to find anything. Stoltze is quite close to the Ravensbrück concentration camp, but some distance from Hermann Göring's home at Karinhal. Why didn't Hermann Göring just dump his looted treasure in the Gross Dölnitzsee, which was closer to his home? Or did he pick up the treasure from Ravensbrück? What Mielke needed was a treasure map, and who better su to supply him with such a map than stern journalist Gerd Heidemann? Now, if you've been following this channel, you'll know of my fascination with the story of the Hitler Diaries. It was none other than Heidemann who discovered the Hitler Diaries, or more the point was the person who managed to con a lot of people over the Hitler Diaries whilst being conned himself. Heidemann was fascinated by Hitler and indeed the entire Nazi regime. I have already described in a different video how he acquired the luxury yacht Karen II, which was originally built for Hermann Goering. In the years that followed, he invested hundreds of thousands of marks in the yacht to restore it to its original condition as much as possible. He managed to buy back Goering's onboard library, as well as the extra-wide toilet seat that had once been custom-made for the Luftwaffe's chief's rather large behind. 
For five years, Heidemann was in a relationship with Edda Goering, the daughter of the Reich Marshal, and she assisted him with her contacts and access to Third Reich memorabilia. If I may, I'd like to make a plug for the British miniseries Selling Hitler, which is not only quite accurate from a historical point of view, but also sets the scene very nicely to see how all these pieces came together to form the Hitler diary scandal. Heidemann had obtained a treasure map from Karlsruhe small arms dealer and former member of the Waffen-SS, Medard Klapper. Klapper, noted for hanging out in far-right circles, allegedly got a hold of the map through a former Luftwaffe adjutant who lived in Venezuela and was close to Goering. The name of this person is not surprisingly secret, probably because the person doesn't exist. Klapper claimed that he just returned to Germany and was completely impoverished and so wanted to sell the map. Heidemann was happy to stump up the cash. The map showed a roughly sketched out lake in the form of the Stolze. There was a house in the woods with two tree stumps to its left. An oversized nail had been driven into one of them marked with an arrow. To the north was a building with a cross on it next to a door and the word Peter, a coded reference to the village of Himmelfort on the lake. The agreement between Heidemann and Mielke was an equal split of the loot. Probably Mielke would have put his share in some safe offshore haven like Goering and today Putin, he owed no allegiance to the regime when it came to sharing his wealth. However, the dreams of those seeking riches from the Third Reich were denied. The treasure map turned out to be just as reliable as the Hitler diaries, and if the treasure is there, then it continues to wait discovery, and of course a complicated legal process to decide who it belongs to. Now call me Mr. Suspicious if you want, but there's one or two holes in this story. Goering had undoubtedly stolen a great deal. He'd built himself a magnificent palace in the forest of the Shorf Heath. This is what it looks like today. This is the exact location of Karinhal, filmed in July 2023. Looking closely, one can perceive stones from the cellars, but the forest in the intervening 78 years had recolonised the land. The collection at Karinhal came to at least 1,375 paintings, 250 sculptures, 108 tapestries and more than 500 other art objects. Goering had the building blown up shortly before the end of the war, presumably after removing all of his loot. Medard Klapper, despite his young age at the time, had claimed to be Goering's SS officer. As far as I'm aware, Goering had no accompanying squad of SS officers. He was a Luftwaffe man and saw Himmler and his SS as a rival. Goering was guarded around the clock by soldiers from the Luftwaffe, of which he was the boss. Goering undoubtedly did send his loot into hiding, and he started this as early as 1943, when he began to store his wealth in a mine in Styria in Austria. As the Red Army approached Karenhal, transports went out on the 23rd of February, 13th of March and 15th of April 1945. The destination, however, was not the Stolze, but Wurtbergtesgaden. After the liberation of southern Germany, most of it was soon rediscovered and brought to Munich. This is Ravensbrück concentration camp. Stolze is very close to Ravensbrück. Prisoners could easily be brought in from there to do the necessary work. However, why would Goering bring treasure all this way when he had two lakes on his doorstep at Karenhal? Heidemann claimed that his informant said that Goering had also hidden melted gold from concentration camp prisoners from Ravensburg in the Stolze. Personally, I don't see how this would have been possible. The concentration camps were run by Himmler's SS and Himmler was careful to ensure that all his loot did not fall into anyone else's hands. There's evidence that SS Hauptsturmführer Bruno Mena delivered such items to the Reichsbank in Berlin more than 79 times, the last time being on the 5th of January 1945. Now, I freely admit that I know nothing of works of art. Indeed, if one came into my motorhome right now and stripped while dancing on the table there, uh, shouting, I'm a work of art, I personally would not recognise it as such. 
However, it does seem to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I imagine that they're not waterproof. And how would Herman have got them out of the lake? Could he swim down 13 metres and pull up the containers they were in? Or did he, just, did he plan on training his dog to do so? There's a witness to the shooting on the shore of the lake who claims to have observed the event in March 1945. The month might be incorrect, but there is no reason to think that the murders might not have happened. There is, however, a far more logical explanation for what happened here. Eric Curler was a pastor and keen local historian. He died in 2016. He studied the legend of the Nazi treasure for many years and developed a different theory. He thinks that boxes could actually have been dumped in the spring of 1945, albeit not with valuables, but documents, for example, about the Ravensbrück concentration camp. The responsible state officer for archaeological monument preservation also thought that this was possible. So, if it were documents, why weren't they burned? I don't know. Uh, maybe it was something other than documents that would not burn. I'm just putting this out as a theory. However, dropping something into a lake, albeit one that's only 13 metres deep, seems to me to be an attempt to get rid of it, rather than to keep it hidden. Be that as it may, if the Stoltzer holds a secret, it has kept it to this day. Nonetheless, I bet this story finds its way back into the papers sometime in the future. And in any case, even if there is no treasure in the lake, it's a fantastic place to go just for a visit, even if you can't be bothered to look for the hidden treasure. Thanks very much for listening. I hope you found that interesting. It was a really good uh, day out for me to actually go to Stoltze. I had this story written well in advance of the visit I made there. And then the visit was really just to sort of confirm things or that I already uh, knew. But anyway, it was a, it was a very good uh, video uh, for me to actually prepare this one. Thanks for being with me. I upload every Friday at 20 hundred hours at least and I often upload at other times as well. So if you're interested in this type of thing, then you'll probably want to subscribe. So all the best from me for now in Germany.